Can you guys see my uh, screen? Okay, can you see it? Yes, I can see it. Excellent. All right. So my name is Josh Sokol. Uh, I am the creator of uh, Simple Risk, which we'll talk about today. Uh, the CEO of Host of Risk, which is basically a uh, risk as a service platform using Simple Risk. Uh, and then my day job, I'm the information security program owner for uh, National Instruments, uh, which is a fairly large uh, measurement test and automation company uh, based out of Austin, Texas. Uh, my role is information security program owner. Um, I handle pretty much any uh, facet of security from uh, risk management, vulnerability management, uh, you know, you, you name it, if it has to do with security, it, it probably goes through me. So that's me. Um, I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about personal risk management um, because I, I think that uh, personal risk management is kind of the, uh, it's something that we all practice in our day-to-day -day, uh, lives and it uh, helps to kind of show what risk management is all about. So in this case, I have an example of your home. Um, maybe this is my home. And my house is in a decent neighborhood, but I still have concerns. I, I've, uh, um, I've said that there are risks involved with living in my neighborhood, uh, such as somebody stealing things. Um, so a person may try to break into my house and, and take one of my television sets, for example. So I've I've said that somebody walking into my house and stealing my TV is a risk. Now, what I've done is I've actually planned mitigations against that risk. So I have uh, alarms. I have an alarm system. It's on my door. It's on my windows, things like that. Um, so what that is, that's a mitigation against the risk of somebody breaking into my house. Um, likewise, I might have a risk of a fire in my house. So I've, uh, I've mitigated that risk with smoke and heat detectors. So personal risk management is something that we do in our day-to-day -day lives, um, often without even realizing that that's it, what we're actually doing. So it's important to, uh, to know about that and to realize that. Now, when we take personal risk management and we apply it to the business, it's actually very similar. In the business uh, environment, we talk about uh, risk management in terms of prioritization. So it's a prioritiz uh, prioritization process where the risk with the greatest loss or impact and the greatest probability likelihood of occurring are handled first. And then risk with lower probability of occurrence and lower loss are handled in descending order. So what we basically do is we take our risk, and you can see the scale on the left says impact, and it goes all the way from insignificant up to extreme. And then on the bottom, we have likelihood, and it goes from remote up to almost certain. And we effectively multiply uh, two different values together, and we figure out where they lie on this scale. And so you can see we have five risks that are plotted against here. We have uh, one risk that was uh, gauged as extreme impact and almost certain likelihood. And so that fell up in the very top right corner as a number one. That's our first priority when we're doing this. Um, all the way down to, you know, we have, we have a, a risk there that's uh, insignificant impact, credible likelihood. Um, and so that fell in, you know, down in that kind of yellowish area down there. So we're able to use these risks as kind of a, a, um, a gauge or, or the likelihood and impact, the risk value as a gauge of where these issues fall within our environment. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to address them in this order. We also have to take into consideration the level of effort uh, as we go through and we address the risks. But it is a good starting point to kind of map these out and figure out um, which risks in our environment are worse than others. So there's lots of different methodologies for handling this. Uh, you know, my simplest tool, which I'll show you guys in a sec, uh, is in large part based off of the NIST SP 800-30 framework. Um, it's, NIST is the, the federal government's uh, standards body, and basically the 800-30 talks about risk management. Um, but there's all sorts of other types of frameworks out there as well. Um, I guess the takeaway here is really um, lots of different frameworks, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all these frameworks are right or that they, they fit your uh, environment. So the problem here is that there, there's somebody else's vision of what risk management should be. Um, at best, they're a pretty decent guideline, and they give you examples of what others are doing, but at worst, they can make risk management look over complicated and make it really difficult to get started on risk management. So, you know, I was going through all this stuff and, and I was realizing that 
while the framework was there, the tool set wasn't really there. Um, so let's start off and let's talk about how we define risk. So risk is the potential that a chosen act or activity, including the choice of inaction, will lead to a loss or some sort of undesirable outcome. So taking that, we can apply risk to all sorts of different things out there. There's economic risk, right? What's, what's the um, chance of the dollar tanking versus the yen? There, there's a risk involved with that if I'm investing in those commodities. Um, we have health, safety, and environmental. Um, you know, here at NI, we have a whole group that focuses on health and safety compliance. And so, you know, what's the risk of somebody um, getting a finger cut off by some sort of machine, right? Um, IT and InfoSec is probably an area where most of you guys are, are concerned. You know, well, what's the risk of uh, somebody DDoSing um, our site? Um, so risk can apply to all sorts of different areas, different things, and we need to take that into consideration here. Um, so our risk formula. Uh, the risk formula basically takes the likelihood, which is the probability of something happening, and the impact, which is the expected loss if that event occurs. Uh, so our classic risk formula, the, the one that you'll read in like the CISP books, for example, is risk equals likelihood times impact. And so if you map out risk as likelihood times impact, uh, where you, know, you can do it on multiple different scales, um, in my case down here you can see a one through five scale, it looks something like this where I've decided that a high level risk, or the risk in red, is anything 15 or greater. And I've decided that anything that's a, a 7 and above, um, is, or a 7 through 14, is medium level risk. And I've decided that a um, 4 and above is low level risk, and that anything um, below that is going to be insignificant. Um, so you can see that when we multiply those levels together, we get a number, and then we're able to map that across the scale. So the one thing that I'd say here, though, is that you need to make your risk formula fit you. So while likelihood times impact is kind of the CISSP definition of risk, uh, it's not always the one that, that works best for your environment. Um, oftentimes I've found that, that I, in my environment, impact is actually the more important value. So what I like to do is I like to weight the impact. And the way that I do that is I take that likelihood times impact value and then I add a, a second impact to that. And what that'll do is it'll actually skew that scale more towards uh, the higher impact level. So you can see um, that this one kind of went out into the left a little bit. And so high risk not only encompasses um, that top right, but it also kind of goes all the way to um, unlikelihood, but extreme catastrophic as well. So we can see the, the um, extra impact weighted there. Um, likewise, you can see underneath that, uh, that we've weighed likelihood. So if you feel like the likelihood of something happening is more important than the actual effect of it, you can, you can take the uh, opposite approach and you can add in a likelihood to that. Um, you can do double weighted impact too, where you take um, likelihood times impact plus impact plus impact, or plus likelihood plus likelihood, right? So you can make your risk formula kind of fit your organization. And I think that's really important um, because as you're going through and doing your risk management, you need to be dynamic about that. It will change. So along those lines, be flexible. Risk management needs to be a custom fit for your organization, and your formula needs to reflect that. Um, it can and likely will change, and wherever you're tracking your risk, you should be able to dynamically update the risk based on that updated formula. What that means is you don't want things like Word documents because they're static. No Excel documents. Um, even though I, I've seen some extremely complicated Excel formulas that look really pretty, it's still really, really difficult to manage those kind of things. And really anything that's static, uh, any sort of static formats, you should try to avoid when you're doing risk management. So when we're determining risks, uh, one of the really important things is that you need to convince your peers that documenting risk is a CYOA approach. If you can do this, if you can tell your, your coworkers that by getting the risk off of their shoulders, by, by taking the stuff that doesn't allow them to sleep at night, and if they can take those risks and um, provide that to management, then you as a risk practitioner will have more risk than you know what to do with. And then you need to take those risks and you give those 
to management, now management has visibility into those risks, and now they can actually address them. And by addressing those risks, now you're allowing those, those people who gave you those risks to sleep at night, right? So it's kind of this, this big cycle. So if you can um, convince them that documenting risks is good for them, then you'll have more risks than you'll know what to do with. There's also some other ways without involving your peers that you can determine risks. So you can have um, network vulnerability scanners. Uh, they'll go, they'll scan your environment, um, they'll find vulnerabilities. I do want to make a, an important distinction here. Risk is not the same thing as vulnerability. Um, vulnerabilities can, uh, can have risk involved with them, but each vulnerability on your website isn't a risk. Um, so for example, maybe your website has multiple cross-site scripting issues. In my mind, each of those cross-site scripting issues probably wouldn't be a risk. What I would probably do is say, you have a risk of users being compromised via a cross-site scripting attack, and then you, know, you would basically gauge the likelihood um, off of the number of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities or something like that, um, and then the impact based on what you can do with that. So I think that's an important distinction to, to come away with here. Um, that leads us application vulnerability. Vulnerability scanners are a good way to ter determine risk. Uh, security mailing lists are a great way. OWASP has a mailing list. Um, you know, there's all sorts of uh, other types of lists that are out there. Um, I like to, to get like dark reading and SANS and some things like that. Uh, security blogs are a great place to learn about risk. Um, doing code reviews, so if you look at developers' code and things like that, um, you can determine risks that way. And Twitter, uh, oddly enough. Um, so I follow a lot of security practitioners uh, via Twitter, and what I've found is that there's uh, a lot of people talking about um, you know, what the latest issues are. You know, did you see this new Microsoft exploit, or Internet Explorer just got this patch, or whatever. Um, a lot of that uh, can help to, um, you know, kind of uh, bring out the risks in your environment. So I think that's uh, an interesting place as well. So when you're evaluating a risk, now, now you've collected all of your risks into one place, and now you have to evaluate. So the question you have to ask yourself is, first of all, is the risk acceptable? What that means is, is the likelier impact of this risk low enough that I'm willing to just accept the consequences if it happens? And you know, unfortunately, in our day-to-day -day lives, there are lots of things that that where the risks are just you have to accept them. Um, so you know, I'll give you an example: um, aliens attacking. Right? Um, the impact is probably you know catastrophic. Right? If aliens attack, you know, people would die, whatever. But in terms of likelihood. What's the likelihood of that happening? And you know, maybe you're a conspiracy theorist and you feel like it's you know extremely likely. Um, I'm going to say that the chances of that happening are, are pretty slim. So in that case, I might just accept the fact that that's going to happen, or that if it did happen, you know, I'm just going to have to live with the consequences. The next question you ask yourself is: Is the risk transferable? So the the question here is: Could I purchase insurance or some other measure to transfer the impact of the risk? To another party. And we see stuff like this uh, in the security world through DDoS insurance, right? Um, if my site goes down due to a DDoS, I can actually buy insurance where they'll compensate me for whatever the business loss is involved in that downtime, right? Um, so there, there's, uh, you know, you can purchase insurance for all sorts of different things. The third one is, is the risk reducible? And this is the area where we're going to, as security practitioners, we're really going to um, have to focus. Because here we're going to look for mitigations that could be put in place to reduce the impact or the likelihood of the risk. So we talk about application vulnerabilities, and we may have a risk of user compromise via cross-site scripting. We have very easy mitigations for that. We can do, um, we might be able to build in the uh, OWASP Enterprise Security API underneath and do um, input validation with that. We might go for a web application firewall that's going to filter those cross-site scripting attacks. In any case, there's multiple mitigations. They may have different levels of effort, different costs associated with it, but now that we've cataloged that as one of our risks, we have to figure out ways to reduce that. 
So what you get when you answer these questions is a, a chart that looks something like this, where now we have to determine how we're going to respond to this risk. And if the answers to our, our question are, the risk is not acceptable, it's not transferable, and it's not reducible, then the answer is, don't do this. Avoid the risk at all costs, because if this risk does happen, bad things are going to happen, and we already said that we're not willing to accept those consequences. All the way up to, uh, you know, if we have a risk that is acceptable, is transferable, and is reducible, then we have the option. We can balance all three of these things, and we can try and optimize, right? So you can go through, you can look at these charts, and you can figure out, you know, what is the best tact for me based on my answers to these questions. The important thing to remember here is risk management is cyclical. What this means is you don't just go through once, catalog all your risks, um, go and identify the mitigations, and then call it a done deal. Um, you know, unfortunately, your environment is constantly changing. Your, uh, there's new threat vectors, new risks coming uh, across all the time. And so you have to make sure that you're um, doing this on a regular basis. So uh, in our environment, what we've decided is that once a year, we're going to go through and we're going to review new risks. And we're going to sit down, we're going to talk about you know, what the new risks are in our environment. At the same time, we're going to be going through and we're going to be looking at the old risks. And so what, what I've decided is that uh, once a year, we're going to look at low-level risks and determine, you know, do we need a new, um, you know, it has something changed that either changes the risk level of this guy or is it no longer necessary to do anything about that? Uh, Medium-level risks, we try and do um, uh, once every 180 days. And then high-level risks, once every 90 days. Um, and I'll get, get back to this a little bit when I start talking about simple risk and showing you the actual demo um, because I've built in some pieces uh, to handle some of this stuff. In any case, your risk management is a cyclical process and you need to make sure that you're, you're following up with these risks on a fairly regular basis. Now, how often that is may depend on your organization, the number of resources, um, how often you're deploying new code. You know, there's all sorts of different reasons why that would change. So our risk review process may depend on how lean your organizational structure is as well. Um, in my case, uh, what I've said is I want to um, raise the visibility of these high-level risks. So my high-level risks in my environment, I actually have my VP uh, review those risks. Medium-level risks, I say my director should see those risks. And then low-level risks, I figure that the area managers, the section managers, should be the ones um, to be able to sign off or accept those risks. Um, so what this does is this drives the visibility of the higher risk levels to the higher levels within the organization. Now you have your VP or executives um, able to see risks that they didn't even know existed before. And now if that risk doesn't get mitigated, now it's on their shoulders instead of the shoulders of, of the individual contributors within the organization. We already talked about re-reviewing the risks on a regular basis, um, so I'll, I'll skip past that piece. It's important to note risk management is not a process for avoiding risk, and the aim of risk management is not to eliminate risk, but rather manage the risk involved in business activities, because we want to maximize the opportunities and we want to minimize adverse effects. Risk management is actually an extremely useful tool for trying to figure out um, how do we enable the business? And a lot of businesses you'll hear talk about calculated risk. Um, so how, how do we take risk? Um, because risk usually leads to more money if it's successful, but how do we make sure that those risks aren't, um, aren't going to cause other issues, right? And another thing to note here is risk management is not the management of insurable risk. Um, insurance is an important way of transferring risk but most risks will be managed by uh, other means. So how do we derive value here? Uh, we basically just take our risks, we order them by the risk level, we can group them if mitigations are the same. Um, for example, uh, I might have multiple teams in my environment that submit a risk around privileged access management. Um, so my units team is concerned about uh, root passwords and where they're storing them. And my Windows team is concerned about their administrative passwords. And 
you know, you, you've got all these different teams that have similar concerns. They've each submitted risks based on their concerns, um, but we can group them because the mitigation, I could put in one tool in place that solves all those risks. And then what we do is we talk to management. We figure out what of those projects is going to be able to be allocated for uh, this next planning cycle. And then once management says, yeah, that sounds like a, you know, that, that risk level is very high. It's high on the prioritization level. Level of effort sounds reasonable. Let's go ahead and do that. And now you're able to actually pass uh, the risk back to the various teams. And you can say that this risk will be addressed by this project, and this project was approved for consideration in the next budget cycle. Um, so risk management can be actually can be used as a very valuable tool in terms of uh, project prioritization and planning. So different tools for enterprise risk management. Um, most of these enterprise tools fall into a category called GRC or governance, risk, and compliance. Um, I'll tell you a little story. Um, I was looking for a GRC tool. Um, I thought that was what I needed for my risk management program. And I started looking, and I, I found one of the tools out there. I brought them in. I, I talked to them quite a bit, and uh, I was like, "Yes, this is the thing for me." And I ended up, uh, you know, I, I eventually got a price because I wanted to put it into my fall planning. And the price on that tool was about half a million bucks. I hand that over to my VP, and she just laughed at me. She laughed because half a million bucks was such a huge piece of my security program. It was actually almost twice as much as, as what I was spending, and it, it just didn't make sense to spend that much on a tool that one person would use. So then I went and I was like, okay, well, maybe I can find a way around this because risk involves multiple people. It involves multiple different groups within my organization. So I pulled in the guys from trade compliance. And I pull in the guys from the health and safety, and I pull in the legal team, and all these different groups. I pull in and I say, hey, here's a demo. Watch this. This is an amazing tool. And we go through and we watch the demo again of the GRC tool, and they're like, yeah, that sounds sweet. And then I threw out a price tag, and they all laughed and walked away. The, the moral of the story is these tools are very, very hard to justify. <clears throat> if you're like me, if you're in a, a small or medium-sized organization, chances of you getting a tool like an Archer GRC are probably pretty slim. So what that means is that most of the organizations out there are actually using things like spreadsheets or Excel, uh, Excel spreadsheets, Word documents, things like that. Um, it's cumbersome, it's complicated, but it, it was the best tool out there. Um, I've heard other groups uh, have kind of tweaked Open FISMA. Um, that was something that came up when I asked this question at uh, B-Sides Las Vegas. Um, I did take a look at Open FISMA. It's not really meant for at least this type of risk management. Um, maybe some people doing DIY. Uh, but what I'd like to do is um, I have, I think, no. Um, I, I had uh, arranged a, a poll in the other thing, but it doesn't look like it made over here. Um, in any case, I, you know, free tools. I, I asked this question at B-Sides Las Vegas, and you know, people were basically saying that you no, know, they they hadn't really heard of any good free tools out there. So that's basically what led me to creating Simple Risk. Um, I was frustrated with the other tools that were out there. Um, I, I didn't want to go the Word doc route. I actually had an internal Lotus Notes database that was uh, a risk management system. Um, it, it was awful. It was cumbersome, but it was a heck of a lot better than uh, spreadsheets and whatnot. Um, but it, in the end, it still wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. Uh, so let's go ahead and let me show you Simple Risk. Uh, so this is the Simple Risk demo site. Uh, if you go to demo.simplerisk.org, uh, you can see the demo site. Um, the username is user. The password is user. Um, I'm actually going to log in as the administrative user. And when I log in as the administrative user, um, what this does for me is this uh, gives me one extra con uh, configuration panel, and I want you guys to be able to see that piece. <clears throat> so give it one sec to, to load here. So you can see when you log in, um, this regardless of whether you're an admin or a regular user, um, you'll start off in the risk dashboard. And so this will show you um, the status of the different risks, how many risks are open, what the categories are, 
um, teams, technologies. You can see closed risks and the reason behind them. Um, so it gives you a good overview of what that is. I'm going to jump right into the configure screen. Um, so the first thing that you'll notice here, let me see if I can make this a little smaller. Um, the first thing that you'll notice here is the risk formula. So just like I talked about earlier, I like to be able to modify the risk formula. So what I have here is the classic risk formula, likelihood times impact, but I also have the ability to adjust that on the fly. So if I decide that I want a heavily weighted impact formula, I can select two times impact and hit update. And what this does is it goes through for all of my risks and it actually modifies this formula um, to use uh, that new formula. It modifies all of my existing risks to use that. So I can usually easily change that kind of thing. The other thing that I can do is I can change my risk level. So I can change what I consider to be a high risk, what I consider to be medium, what I consider to be a low level risk very easily just by modifying these things. And you can see this chart changes, it automatically updates the risk and we're good to go. Um, so that's the risk formula. If I go into review settings, we can see what, what I just talked about in terms of how often we do these reviews. So you can see I want to review high level risks every 90 days, medium every 180, low level risks every 360. Again, all you have to do is change the number, hit update, and now you're, you're running with those new values. I'll show you where those come into play in the risk management section in a sec. Um, like I said, your risk management program should be dynamic. And in order to be dynamic, I had to build in the ability to change my categories, to change the teams that are involved. So you can add new teams, you can delete the existing team. Very, very easy to do so um, through this add remove values. User management. Um, so right now, uh, default user is just a basic simple risk user. That means that we use um, internal users to the system. Um, passwords are all hashed uh, multiple times over. Um, so you don't have to worry about storing uh, passwords or anything like that. Um, right now you can select uh, what team they're a part of. That goes through that add remove value so you can change what these are. And then there's a full-on user responsibility section here. So you can say which users, when you add them, are able to submit new risks. Which ones are able to modify existing risks. Who can plan mitigations. <clears throat> and then we talked a little bit about who I have reviewing low, medium, and high level risks in my environment. We have the ability to specify this user can review low risk, medium risk, high level risk. And then the last one is access to this configure menu, uh, effectively making them an administrative user. Um, you have the ability to view um, details for each of the users in your environment. You have the ability to enable and disable users. Um, this is a good way uh, if somebody leaves your environment and you want to disable the account, but you still want them to be associated with you know, owners of risks and things like that, you can disable it versus just deleting it. You can still delete it if you want to. Um, it has the ability to send password reset emails, which are just long random strings that it can use to reset it. <clears throat> you can redefine my naming conventions for impact likelihood and mitigation effort. So if you don't want insignificant, if you want something else, you select that, tell it what you want to change it to, click update, you're good to go. The system also maintains a full audit trail. So every activity that happens within the system, you can actually see through here. So you can see when people log in, when they're changing things. Um, you know, you can see right here that I changed the risk level score and the risk formula, um, you know, all sorts of stuff. And it looks like even after I, um, it looks like probably one of you guys logged in as user um, while I'm sitting here talking, which is awesome. <clears throat> I've built some extras. Uh, so right now I've built uh, an extra to do Active Directory authentication. So when you go into user management, there's actually another option, which is LDAP. This only works if you have that um, Active Directory piece. Uh, right now, anybody who donates $500, $500 or more uh, to the Simple Risk Project, um, you automatically get that, that module. Um, there's a couple other things that I'm working on developing right now. Um, notifications uh, via email is something that I'd like to do. Um, restricting of who can see which risk is something that I'm working on. Um, database encryption is something that I'm working on. So those are some extras that I'm working on right now. The announcements pulls from uh, a remote server and just pulls in the latest news. 
Um, so you can see uh, notes about the new versions of Simporis, things that are changing. Um, you can see uh, you know stuff like me on the OWASP webinar, um, so all sorts of things. And then lastly, in the About section, you can see the application version. So this is the latest application ver version that I'm, uh, or the version that I'm running, the latest application version out there, um, latest database version. You can download the most recent code just by clicking there. Um, so yeah, that's the configure section, highly configurable. Um, I wanted to make it so that you could add, remove things as you wanted to. Risk management is very easy. Uh, basically, you just go risk management. The first thing you're going to see is submitting your risk. And so you can see it's got subject. So you can put um, uh, subject is uh, cross-site scripting in critical web application. Let's change that a little bit. Um, cross-site scripting leads to user compromise. <clears throat> If uh, you're doing something that has like a, a CBE number associated with it, or um, you're tracking some sort of um, Microsoft reference or something like that, you have the ability to put something into there. We can set our site location. This list is populated via the admin menu. So if you want to add something other than Austin, Texas, uh, feel free. Um, category is right here. So user compromise, I'm going to say that's technical vulnerability. I'm going to say this falls to um, my web systems team. Technology, I'm just going to say web. Again, all these things are highly configurable. Um, my owner is going to be the demo user. The manager is going to be my demo manager. Um, my risk scoring method here is going to be classic, but we also have the ability to rate risk based on CVE. So if you go to CVE and say score risk using, you actually get a nice little pop up with some instructions that kind of tell you how you're rating this risk, what each of these things mean. So you can very easily score things that way. Otherwise, classic risk is basically just one through five scale. Um, it is uh, very likely that somebody would do that. The impact is going to be moderate. I put an assessment here saying um, cross-site scripting is everywhere and I hit submit. <clears throat> Once I hit submit, that risk goes into the system. And now I go plan my mitigations. So if I go um, here, and we can actually see right here, this risk is 1089. <clears throat> we can see the risk level. So this came in at 4.8. Uh, this is on a 0 through 10 scale. And the reason why it is 0 through 10 scale uh, is because that's how CVSS is scored. So I'm actually taking that classic risk formula, and then I'm basically dividing it by the biggest possible number um, in order to figure out uh, how that would fall on a 0 through 10 scale. So uh, as far as I know, Simple Risk is the only tool that allows you to take kind of the classic risk formula and the CVSS formula and apply them on the same scale. Um, kind of neat there. So we can see here uh, for our risk that no mitigation has been planned yet. So we can just click on no and it asks us what our planning strategy is. Do we want to research this more? Do we want to accept it? Do we want to mitigate it? Or do we want to watch it? In this case, I'm going to say mitigate it. So the effort, uh, I'm going to say, is considerable. Um, we don't have a current solution. <clears throat> our requirements are to, um, uh, we're going to do um, HTML output encoding and input validation. And then we're going to recommend to uh, purchase LWAF as well. So we hit submit. You can see on the bottom here, here's all the details about the risk that we've submitted. Uh, so we hit submit. Our mitigation has been submitted successfully. And now we move on to performing our management reviews. So here we can see, um, actually, let me go back here. Once you say that the mitigation has been planned, once you hit submit, that risk will no longer show up in this list. So this list right here is only the mitigations or only the risks that don't have mitigations planned for them. Likewise, performing management reviews is the list of all the risks that don't have management reviews planned. <clears throat> so you can see here's our risk right here. Cross-site scripting leads to user compromise. We can see now we have a mitigation plan for this guy. So now we want to perform our management review. When we perform our management review, we're going to approve the risk. Our next step is to consider this for a project. Um, and we say, uh, 
uh, consider for uh, WAF purchase project. Hit submit. And in just a sec, it should uh, tell us that we reviewed successfully. And now that risk has disappeared from the list for management reviews. So now we move on to the next step, which is prioritizing for project planning. Um, what we're doing over in, in this step is we're actually determining um, what uh, projects are assigned to which risks. So in this case, I'm going to um, create a new project named WAF Purchase. And I say Add. And that adds a new project. You can see that here. Um, to me, this is my most important project on the list. So I'm actually going to pull this up to the top here. And I'm going to update that. And now we can see WAF Purchase actually moved right here. <clears throat> and now under Unassigned Risk, we can see, because we said consider this for a project, we can see cross-site scripting leads to user compromise. So I just take that guy, I drag into the WAF Purchase project, and I hit Save Risks to Projects. And now it's no longer an unassigned risk. It's now in my WAF purchase project. And now um, what I can do is I, I can actually report on that in a sec. And I can see um, the risks that are assigned to the projects. Um, the last step here is regular reviews. So we mentioned that uh, risk management is cyclical. Um, so in this case, what you can see here is all of my risks. And we can see the next review day. Now, a bunch of these risks uh, people submit, there, there are lots of users who are going in here and demoing simple risks, um, but they never actually performed a review. So you can see for all these risks, the next review date is unreviewed, meaning they have to go back and actually perform that review. We can also see the risks in here that have been submitted, and based on whether that's low, medium, or high level risk, you can see when the next review date will be. So in this case, um, this is a low level risk, it was submitted. Uh, 67 days ago, and I'm supposed to review it every um, 360 days, so it schedules it for July 14th of next year. Um, likewise, I have a high-level risk. This was submitted 59 days ago. Um, my high-level risks are set to review every 90 days, so this is scheduled for October 25th. So very easily, you can go into here, you can see what risks um, should be reviewed by management, and you can see what risks are coming up in which order. Um, one of the, the future things that I hope to build into Simple Risk is the ability to basically plot these on a calendar. So you can see, um, basically add a little calendar notice to yourself saying this risk is due on this date. Um, make it even simpler. Uh, we don't have any in here, but if it goes past the date that it's actually due on, um, it'll actually show as past due, um, letting you know, hey, this risk is now in a past due state. You actually need to go in and review this one. So very easy to see your risks, to review them. Um, if you click on this guy right here, this will bring you back to that review page where you can then review the, the risk itself. Or if you click on this number right here, um, let's go, let's find our cross-site scripting one here. Um, so you can see we just submitted this, it's at zero days. And this one is due um, for review on March 24th, 2014 because it's medium level risk. And so we can go, we can click on this guy right here, and we can see all the details of our risk that we've submitted. We can see what the details are on the risk itself, what the mitigation is, and when the last review is. We can edit the details if we want to. We can edit the mitigation. We can see, so if there's multiple reviews, we can actually view all of the reviews on here. There's an area section here at the bottom for comments, and I'll show you in a sec where you can add those. And then there's the audit trail. Each individual risk has its own audit trail, so you can see who's doing what, who's modifying things on the risk, who's adding comments. Um, so very easy to track that kind of stuff down. There's an action menu here at the top. This allows me to close the risk if I want to. Um, maybe I've remediated the risk, so I can go through and I can say, um, close risk. What is the reason? I've fully mitigated the risk now. Um, so we uh, added a WAF, right? Um, so I can go ahead and close that guy. Um, likewise, I can change it to score by CVSS. So if we want to score it, um, if we decide we didn't want it to be classic risk, we want it to be CVSS scoring instead, we can change that. Um, we can perform a new review. So maybe this review is out of date. We want to perform a new one. We can do that. And we can add a comment here and say um, the risk of cross-site scripting is really uh, bad 
our users don't like this, right? And then we can submit that. And now we can see at the bottom here, we have a new comment from the admin user saying the risk of cross-site scripting is really bad. So really easy to kind of document your risk, um, plan your mitigations, perform your reviews. If at any point in time, let's say this risk needs to be reopened, we can even reopen it from here. Um, admin uh, or any of the users has the ability to see their profile. So you can go in and, and look at your profile details. Um, you can see my name, my email address, you can see what teams I'm assigned to, uh, user responsibilities, you can change your password through this thing. Um, <clears throat> you, uh, as a user, cannot modify any of these things. You can only change your password, but at least you can see what you have access to. And then there's a full area here with reporting. We already talked about the dashboard, but you can view all the risks by risk level. So this is everything in the system. You can see the individual risk, what was rated. Um, you can see if a mitigation has been planned, has management review been performed. You can see, and, and these are actually the risks assigned to me. Um, you can see all open risk by risk level. This is everything uh, that's in there. You can see all open risk considered for projects. So we can see um, these are all the, the risks that are in there um, that have been considered for projects. Uh, we can see open risks accepted until next review. So these are the ones that were accepted until the next review. These are the ones submitted uh, as production issues. And then you can even see all the risks that have been closed. And in this case, um, you know, I said that our cross-site scripting one would be considered for a project, but then I went ahead and closed it. So it no longer shows up in there. It now shows up in my closed risk list. So that, uh, that is basically simple risk. Um, it was designed to be uh, extremely simple, easy to use, um, yet highly configurable so that it, it works uh, regardless of the environment that's being put in and regardless of who, uh, who's using this. You know, maybe you're a finance company and you're looking for something to handle financial risk or maybe you're um, an application security expert and you want to be able to handle AppSec risk. So that's the basis of, of Simplorus there. Um, real quick, Simplorus was designed with security in mind. I use parameterized database queries. I do input validation, HTML output encoding. Uh, passwords are hashed. Um, it's actually capable of an N-tier architecture. Um, so you can define a separate database server from the application server. Uh, it's got the full-on uh, audit trail in there. Um, so lots of security features are, are built into the product, and I'm adding more and more all the time. Um, it's free. It's open source. It's under the Mozilla Public License 2.0. And if you want to download it, you can go to www.simporus.org. Um, it's probably one of the most well-documented uh, free open source tools that, that I've seen. Um, I even wrote a LAMP installation guide, and using this guide on like a, an Ubuntu server, um, you should be able to get Simple Risk up and running in about 30 to 60 minutes, depending on your, your level of technical expertise. Um, I've done it enough times, I can probably have an instance up and running in about 15 minutes or so. Um, I also want to note, if you want Simple Risk, if you like what you've seen, but you either don't have the technical ability to run an Apache web server um, with PHP and MySQL, or you don't want to host those servers yourselves, maybe you like the cloud SaaS approach, um, a, a partner and I have spun up hostedrisk.com, and this is basically just risk as a service. It's the ability to run simple risk in a cloud environment, dedicated MySQL database, um, dedicated uh, web server. Um, you have your, your own system, your own everything, basically. Um, so you can check that out if that interests you. So with that, I'm done with my presentation. Uh, if you want to email me, josh at simplerist.org or josh at hostedrisk.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Josh Sokol. Um, I blog frequently on webadminblog.com. Um, and then uh, you already got the other websites. Are there questions? Um, there was one question. Um, somebody asked, can the risk calculations or rating scales be modified on a target or project basis, i.e., I may want a different scale for internal web apps versus external customer web apps? Um, so if you're doing something like that, I wouldn't recommend the classic risk model. I would actually recommend CVSS. So um, if we go in, let me just pull a, a risk out of here. 
Um, I think I have something. All right. So if I switch this guy to, actually, let me submit a new risk. Um, so if I modify this to CVSS and I scroll with this, um, you actually have, with CVSS scoring, um, you have the ability to specify what's the attack vector. So is this local, is it adjacent network, or is it network? So if the risk itself uh, has to do with a vulnerability that ha you have to be on my local network in order to exploit, then I would select local. If it's something where um, somebody on the internet uh, can hit it, I would say network. And so I would say, you know, there's other pieces, obviously, to the CVSS scoring. Um, it also has temporal and environmental components to it. Um, but I would say that this is probably the way to go uh, if you're looking to differentiate between different environments or things like that. Any other questions? No, that, that, was, that was it. Okay. You did a great job explaining. Cool. Um, well, if you do have any questions after this point, you can email me, uh, josh at simporus.org. Um, happy to answer questions. Happy to help people if you're running into setup challenges or things like that. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for uh, attending the webinar. Okay, great. Thank you, Josh. Thank you.